The new covenant, as mentioned and brought up by Jeremiah 31, 31 to 40. So we, are so we Christians are so familiar with that phrase, the new covenant, because of what Apostle Paul says. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Definitely, that was the new covenant. But when Jeremiah says, I will bring about a new covenant, we quickly jump to the fact, oh, yes, yeah, we have the new covenant. We are the new covenant. But stop. We have to, it's dangerous to read it that way because they have no clue what your new covenant is or even of the Messiah. See, we have to understand it from their context. They're going through a terrible time. And God said, I will bring you back. I will institute a new covenant. See, yeah, we have to think in their context. What did they hear when, when this is spoken to them? Understand that, see, I guess it's, see, because we quickly jump, we read the, Old Testament in our, into our context, and we missed the th rich tapestry of their struggles, of what God is trying to to teach them. The, these would, you know, the new covenant in, in our Lord Jesus would not happen for another five six hundred years. So they have no concept of it. So we must read it in their context. What did they do? They hear about this new covenant. If we read the details of what God is going to do from <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 31 to 40, it says, 31 definitely says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. So, so a little about that later on. And not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, see, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I am a husband to them, saith the Lord, and this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Whoa. See, that it's packed with meaning there. So if we just read a new covenant in my blood there, there's, then we fail to see what is his trying to, what Jeremiah, the word of the Lord is trying to tell us here is, is, you know, one thing I learned is to correct the fallacy that we have even today. So, as what is new covenant? You know, the, the previous covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, they know, okay, it's written on tablets, the Ten Commandments written outside. They have to have the priest to tell them, you know, um, be obedient, this is what you do. You know, it's all laid out in, in the Torah. Here, the new covenant, God says, I will put them in their heart. Hmm. So it's not be external, it's going to be internal. So they know no longer will somebody needs to tell them each. So now it becomes the individual's responsibility to be obedient. No longer will the sins of the father be visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. Each one is responsible. And and if we read what what the new covenant is, a repetition of the old covenant, really, except God said, I will be in their heart. I will give them the power and ability to be obedient. That is the new covenant. And even to us today, we, with the whole help of the Holy Spirit, is given the power to be obedient the same way. And then we think, hmm, did they have the Holy Spirit? We have it. We're better off than them. No. God is spirit. And he would be in their hearts, in the spirit. But the spirit is poured liberally after the ascension of our Lord Jesus. Why? Maybe we need it more. If you look at the distractions and the temptations we have today. <laughs> it's, it's much, we definitely will concur that it's much more than those days. So we need, so we're not better off or anything. So we cannot compare. And we are more privileged than they are. I mean, that would be wrong to think that. So here, 
Verse 33, but this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law in their inmost parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. See, there, there is this commentator who says, well, with their things, their sins, we we keep harping on. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, you know, that I did this with well, major sins. And that we go to heaven and we tell, Lord, I, I'm sorry the time I did that. And God said, what? I can't remember. <laughs> he will not remember our sins that he has forgiven. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I will remember that sin no more. And, and the... Most important part is it does not only speak of the re, the exiles Judah, the exiles to Babylon. That's one he which he will bring back. See throughout the later part in this book of consolation, God throughout says, "I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of." Judah. And before that, in chapter 31 again, 7, verse 7. For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob. Jacob? What is Jacob? Jacob is the 12 tribes of Israel. So here we go, <laughs> the lost tribes of Israel. <laughs> we keep harping on that. That's the only thing we remember. See, because we do not read the details of the Old Testament. We read excerpts of it, those that point to, we think, the Messiah, and that is relevant for our times. But if we go drill down deeper, it speaks constantly of the returnees from Babylon and of Israel. He, they're not lost. No one is lost to God. He knows where they are. And previously, he says, I will bring them all back from wherever I've scattered them. <gasps> he will reconstitute the united Israel again. The, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So this return from exile has precipitated many things that, that we today experience. And because we don't, do not really drill down, we skip over it. And when we hear of the new covenant, we, we quickly grasp that the new covenant in my blood, that's it. And we forget the rest. First thing, there are no lost tribes. God will bring them all back, not just from Babylon, from wherever he has scattered them. That includes the northern kingdom. They're not lost. So we continue with this meme, the lost tribe of Israel, the lost tribe, but everybody's claiming to be the lost tribe of Israel. And we start a whole new religion, the Mormon faith that we are the lost tribe of Israel. It's like, <laughs> if we read Jeremiah, we know that he's bringing them all back. See, not just that. He's bringing in, in Isaiah, we've already read, the sons of the strangers. Who are these people? The Gentiles, see. And the other th thing that Christians fail is because Jesus spoke Arabic, we think like Islam. Arabic is God, our last language, the language of angels. So if the Lord Jesus spoke Aramaic, it must be the holy language. Then there is no such thing. Why was Arabic spoken? See, the exile, the return, and the return of exile has a lot to do with it. It's only, Hebrew is only spoken and used by the Jewish people, the Hebrews. Outside of them, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, Aramaic is spoken. So when the, when the uh, ten tribes went into exile, they got deported to the various parts of Assyria. 
They picked up Aramaic. They have to. And when these, when Judah went into exile in Babylon, they picked up Aramaic. They have to. Daniel worked in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. He, the, the book of Daniel is in Aramaic. Nehemiah too was in Aramaic. And they came back speaking Aramaic. <laughs> so, so they have this dilemma. The scriptures is in Hebrew and nobody knows Hebrew anymore. So much so that everybody has a, a foreign wife. It's like, get rid of your foreign wives and what? nobody understands Hebrew anymore. So the scriptures now then has to be translated into Aramaic, the Targums. So that's why we have Aramaic being the language on the streets, see? So in those days, even in temple worship, the, the scripture is read in Hebrew, and then it's read in Aramaic, and then the explanation. So that's, that's why Jesus spoke Aramaic. It's not a holy language. It's the lingua franca of the streets in those days, which later became Greek. So, so in doing Jeremiah, we have fixed a lot of fallacies in our understanding. <laughs> even till today. I have, anyway. And I will continue soon on in the next post regarding that. we we'll continue with Jeremiah. We are almost to the end of it, and I didn't think it would be so exciting. It is. One more thing. Here in the New Covenant, God says, I will, I will, I will. So the commentator says, the great I am says, I will. This is this is marriage language. Will you take this man as your lawful wedded husband? Will you take this woman? I will. So God, especially in 31, verse 32, second part, it says, oh, you know, they broke the covenant, the covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, although I was a husband unto them. So this is marriage covenant language, I will, I will. God has always understood himself to be the husband of Israel. You know, you are my bride. And this new, new covenant, he, he re-emphasizes and restore that marriage covenant. He did not break it, but his bride, the Hebrews broke it. But he says, I will, I will, I will. Imagine the great I am says, I will to you, to me. One further thing that I found from Andrew Shea's book on the the new covenant. What is the new the new covenant means no longer will Israel be judged as a nation. It will be individual. Individual response. God will be in each heart and each person will be judged individually going forward. And and not just that. The, he will, there is reference to the house of Israel, house of Judah. So from now on, it is the ideal universal people of God that is in view that Israel, the new Israel, is one of the many nations, the nations of the world that Jeremiah comes, you know, he has to tear down the old Israel, the old notion of the a, a nation favored by God, but it becomes, he has to tear, tear that down build it up into one of the nations of the world, which we are included. So it's a, lastly, this new Israel is promised in verse 29, that they will no longer die for their parents' sin. So it becomes, so this new covenant is significant in that sense.